All right. Wow. It's so exhilarating to be here. I was just talking to some people about how grateful I am and we are that there's an arts and culture section of appreciating data viz and being able to explore those non-traditional ways of viewing and experiencing data. So uh, it's so exciting to be here. And what I'm going to do in this talk is introduce myself, tell you a little bit about my process and my data installation, Ripple Effect. So I didn't realize the scale of the screen, so <laughs> it, it may look a little menacing, my figure, but we're, we're gonna move past it. I'm gonna start by telling you a little bit about myself, so I'm not just some stranger up here talking at you. Um, so I actually grew up as a ward of the state in Nebraska, so I got exposed to the foster care system at a young age. And I ended up going to college and got my first full-time design job at a local print shop, working with local businesses and doing all different kinds of swag, like t-shirts and brochures and stickers and things like that. I ended up deciding to pursue a master's of fine arts, so I moved to Tucson, Arizona. And while I was getting my master's, I was working at an environmental science lab that ended up extending beyond my master's. And currently I work in the energy industry doing data visualizations in a woman-owned consultancy and we're evaluating energy efficiency programs throughout the US. So throughout this progression, I um, have this vibrant freelance design and art practice. It's always been a part of who I am. And um, this is where this project, Ripple Effect, was born out of. So I've been following IIV for quite some time, and um, I'm quite inspired, as I'm sure a lot of you are, by David McCandle's work. And he said that data is the new soil. It's this fertile creative medium that visualizations will bloom out of. And in this information age, we've produced massive amounts of data. But we know that data by itself is not enough. Raw data are just numbers disconnected facts, inert material. And when we design information, we start to reveal the deeper patterns and connections that shed light on a topic, give it meaning, and allow the human brain to focus on the information that, that matters, that yields new data insights. So what I'm interested in, and what I think about a lot, and I think this work will reflect, is designing with data in a way that reflects the, um, the functional, social, and emotional behavior of users. And I really like to think about starting with the needs and insights of people rather than leading with data. So in this vein, I've explored, um, as what was just stated, is data physicalization, um, what it means to have an embodied data presentation that people relate spatially with, and I'm really interested in the question of what can art do rather than just what information is being visualized. So I wanted to start this presentation by placing us in, of all places, Tucson, Arizona, which I'll talk about, and give you some insight into the process of discovery that was a part of this project for me. So as a part of my graduate study, I was brought into the University of Arizona in the Master of Fine Arts programs while working in an environmental science lab whose research was focused on measuring contaminants in rural, low-income communities that neighbored mining and extraction activity. So Arizona has this vast history of extraction. Our economy was built on copper and was part of the Old West mining boom. Uh, which went pretty strong for a century and left a legacy of waste, environmental contamination, illness, and premature death in mining communities. So, and as we're now seeing from big industry, this has exacerbated climate change effects all across the globe. And we also know that these effects are unevenly felt, that they disproportionately have impacted rural communities, low-income communities, and also um, in Arizona, Mexican, Latino, and uh, indigenous communities. So that's part of the history, but it's another story when you drive into these towns and you recognize the scale. So this is from Ajo, Arizona. Um, I've traveled to a lot of different mining communities through this work, 
And you can see in the bottom the basketball courts that just gives you a reference of the scale of these open mining pits. It almost resembles these old 19th century paintings of the sublime, the visual sublime, but yet you have this very distinct experience because while, while you're in awe from the scale, you also realize that it's a toxic landscape. So it goes kind of hand in hand with this awe of human interaction and the scale at which we're able to operate, but paired with seeing some of those iridescent colors, you realize the effects that this has had on humanity. And it's a very distinct relationship with nature. Um, I'll just zoom in for the scale. There's a certain, um, you know, there's certain smells and, and ways of, of interacting. Um, and slowly as a nation, we're becoming more accustomed to this presence of toxicity. You can think of the Animus River in 2015 when um, EPA reps broke open the old mining tunnel that spilled into the river and it, it turned the river orange, or the California skies from the wildfires. So younger generations are becoming more accustomed to this. And one of the towns that we worked in, Hayden Winkleman, um, these are some pictures I took while visiting. You can see the science classroom that is right in front of the smelter, the smokestack, and the playground. A toxicology study found that blood lead levels are two times higher than that of the national average in this community. So I was brought in in the environmental science lab under an NSF grant and it was called Project Harvest and it's a citizen science project where we trained community members on how to collect environmental samples. So here, this is actually some of the design work I did going over the sampling materials and showing them how uh, they could connect or collect samples on their own property. So a lot of residents did their own sustainable practices of gardening and rainwater harvesting, and they wanted to know if this media was being contaminated by their environment. So a very informed and um, a very informed question. So we would train them on how to collect samples on their own property and send them to the laboratory for analysis on a broad suite of contaminants. And we would report them back via these data sharing events where we'd show them the results. So I was tasked with this question of how do we visualize this information to communities? Pollution in real time is incredibly powerful. And if we think about exposure pathways, we all had this experience collectively going through COVID, is that you don't have awareness when you're being exposed to something. You can breathe in particles or you can drink water and unknowingly be harming yourself and getting sick over time. So what's also incredibly complicated about this question, it's not a simple question, right, is that this is very personal data involving people's property that can affect their property value, the plants in their own gardens, their local environment, their neighborhoods, and ultimately their health. And what we know is that traditional science communication methods, such as the 50-page reports, the graphs, pamphlets typically do not reach the people most impacted by environmental pollution. And in fact, these communities can often feel excluded from these results and findings. In the science world, the output is usually academic studies, which are exclusive to those who have a particular kind of knowledge and literacy. And also is not accessible to everyone, especially for people who don't speak the language or don't have access to internet or don't know technical scientific terminology. We also have all come across a graph right during COVID that's very reductive. It reduces something so unfathomable like the number of deaths from COVID into these data points. And so we're seeing people's lives represented through points on a graph that amount to thousands and thousands of deaths, and it inevitably detaches us from the subject matter and the, and the message. So in a world of information saturation, we become desensitized from constantly being flooded with these online data graphics or flashy news headlines or social media posts. Okay, so with all these issues in mind, as I thought through, how do I visualize environmental data that's personal to people's lives? I found an entry point through art. 
because there's something that art does that connects us back to the personal, the bodily experience, the present moment. And I wanted to use art as an experience to allow people into the conversation rather than exclude. So I was posed this, with this question, and I went to a conference that they threw a bunch of 20-some-year-olds together and said, solve the world issues on, on uh, water problems. And it was a very daunting question, and we're like, okay, you know, we'll take a stab at it. But I met with this digital sound engineer who was showing me how he composed um, his digital sound compositions. And we found it interesting that there was a similarity of forms with the ebb and flow of data and the crescendo and decrescendo of his sound compositions. So we started mapping out what, what it really meant to listen to our environment. That there's all these, you know, sort of talking heads on policy strategies of directing natural resources, but what does it mean to kind of tap into our environment. We kind of came up with this idea of a radio and different microphones where we can maybe listen to different natural bodies of water. So the question became, what if water itself could visualize its quality and perform the level of contamination? I discovered this phenomenon of water cymatics, and most com commonly people remember the scene from Jurassic Park where the dinosaur is walking in and there's these impending footsteps and the water is vibrating. And so that is from the vibrational patterns of sound. So out of this was born the project Ripple Effect, which uses water cymatics to have water perform its own level of contamination. So it's an art installation, works with technology to do data sonification. And so when you play, the sound that through Max MSP we're able to translate the data to sound and you set a tray of water on top of the speaker, the vibrational patterns will show the level of contamination in the water. So we actually use the sonic parameters so that the higher chemical concentrations equate to lower frequencies, because that increases resonance, intensity or volume or sound, of sound, and also bass and, and resonance. So this is at Biosphere 2. The more active the water, the higher the contaminant concentration. So here's the data to sound translation I talked about. You can collapse, if let's say you have three years of data, you could collapse it into three minutes of a soundtrack, depending on how much data points you have and what increment of sound you're assigning to the data points. And the higher concentration is increased volume and bass and lower frequency. So here are some process pictures. The LED light illuminates every time a data point exceeds a maximum contaminant level set by the EPA. So that further codifies the exhibition. And the more active the water, the higher the chemical concentration. So this is actually showing the data set that I worked with in Flint where individual data points exceeded the action lead level up to 300 to 1,500 times the limit. So what happens then is the water actually lifts up from the data, uh, the, the bowl of water. And so this actually traveled to rural communities throughout Tucson, uh, not museum spaces. These were community settings that people were used to going. And we actually beta tested some of this with the community itself to see if this was an effective way to show information. So this was back when the project, I still had to trigger the Arduinos uh, with the button to share with some of the community health workers. And I'm running out of time, so I'll go through some of this. But this traveled to so many different places now. It's been to the Venice Biennale, 
which was a more elevated um, presentation. And I can't play that because of the sound. But then the other thing we're doing is measuring the impact that this has on people. I was able to work with various scientists to do a case control study of half the participants receiving their results in booklet and then half with the art installation and the booklet and then they would switch the next year around. And what we found was that this is affecting participants' senses which causes them to pay more attention to the data. They also developed a spatial and temporal and embodied understanding of their data. They talk about being part of their data a different consciousness and understanding of their environment. They also had stronger intentions to change their garden or rainwater harvesting behavior based on the results. And they followed through with those actions six months after seeing the data. So we, we would call them up in interviews and check to see if they did anything different based on what they saw. So the memory plays an important role is that it translates into action. Also, we did a whole corpus analysis, and this goes really into the weeds, but um, on, the, on how people spoke about themselves in relation to their data. And what we found that in ripple effect, participants were more likely to place themselves and other people in the center of the discussion, versus in booklet, they would place the data in the center of the discussion, which I think is a really significant finding, is that people were able to have an entry point into some of their memories like the fumes that, that came up from the mine or the acid rain that they would experience growing up. So to close, I wanna say for the people of the field in information design, I urge you to ask the question, as I continue to ask myself, how do we see our work through? How do we take ourselves away from the endless visualization options and software and put our work into public spaces as interventions, as proposed conversations, and a space for reflection and interaction. How do we reach audiences that may be excluded? If we focus more on where data viz can be employed to make an impact or facilitate human connection, we can avoid producing more graphics that are passively consumed and ultimately forgotten. Thank you so much.